Hello and welcome everybody to today's R Performance Tips. Uh, my name is Jessica Morgan and I will be your host today. I'm excited to bring you today's topic, the deadly truth about shock. Uh, today uh, we will be joined by Seth Gully, one of our performance improvement specialists here at Lucas OPT. Before we begin, I want to remind all of you a little bit about the ON24 platform. Many of the boxes and images that you see on the screen can be moved around and resized. Feel free to move those around and make the console exactly the way that you want it to for maximum enjoyment. And if you minimize something and are looking for it again, there is a menu bar at the bottom that you can click that will pop those right back open. Be sure to take advantage of the question box on the screen and submit any questions along the way that you might have. And uh, we've got a little preview for you a little after today on what shock sometimes looks like. All right, Seth, take it away. All right. Hey, guys, welcome to uh, our On24 today, our performance tips. And, uh, yeah, Mr. Bean, I, I don't know about you guys, but he's one of my favorites. Um, and you can actually learn a lot from that. Uh, um, they're very funny comedian. So um, we're talking about shock today. And uh, Mr. Bean, right then and there, he uh, he actually had a bit of shock. Um and we're going to talk about what category of shock does that actually fall into, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how um, how we treat it. So, uh, as you guys can see up on uh, on the screen there, there are four main types of shock, and there's obstructive, cardiogenic, distributive, and hypovolemic. And uh, yeah, I know those are all kind of big terms. Um, but uh, we're going to kind of expand on them a bit, and uh, you guys will learn what what shock really is. But uh, it, it's um, it's pretty simple to understand uh, holistically, though. Shock is really just the body's starvation of oxygen. So if you don't have any good perfusion, um, your blood pressure drops, as in Mr. Bean's video there. His blood pressure dropped um, enough that uh, being able to absorb the oxygen, oxygen into his brain um, caused him to basically black out and pass out. And uh, that would be a distributive shock. So it's something that happens, um, and I think everybody has experienced that. Anybody that stood up really quick, you know, and uh, has become lightheaded, uh, your blood pressure drops um, uh, just for a split second, and uh, you get lightheaded, and that, 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 my friends, is distributive shock. So um, we're going to continue on here, and we'll expand upon uh, what these really are. So uh, I addressed it a little bit. So obstructive shock is basically the blood just simply doesn't get to where it needs to go. Um, something has obstructed it in, in somehow, some way. Uh, so it's impinging upon the heart itself. Uh, it's a little bit different than cardiogenic shock, um, which is definitely affecting um, the, the function of your, of your heart, which we'll cover here in a second. But uh, the obstruction um, could be fluid. As you can see in the picture, fluid builds up in your lungs and it, uh, it settles there and it, it puts pressure on your heart. Um, therefore, your heart isn't able to pump out what it needs to in the form of oxygen um, and you, uh, you impact your body in a shock-like fashion. So you, you rob yourself again of oxygen um, because of pressure that's been building up in your chest or it could be a blockage in your your artery or a vein or something like that, primarily an artery, but that obstruction actually puts pressure on there and it allows your heart not to function as well. Again, um, not allowing that, that oxygen to get to what it needs to get to. So uh, another form here um, is the actual um, cardiogenic shock. So. Uh, cardiogenic shock, kind of mentioned it briefly before, but that is basically where your, your heart, it, it stops functioning. Uh, and it's from either um, like a ventricular fibrillation. You know, if somebody um, goes into cardiac arrest, for instance, they, um, that's a form of cardiogenic shock. Your heart is 
is pumping potentially, but it's pumping radically. It's fibrillating, or it might be even tachycardic. And it's something electrical. Your heart is out of sync. Your heart is, is that source of why you're not getting oxygenated blood to where you need to. Um, so something has impacted your heart. It's simply just not working the way it's supposed to. And uh, that, those are the things that that we don't think about too much. But realistically, shock happens all the time. Um, even uh, even just a cut on your finger, you may experience just this reaction in your body that you kind of start getting a little queasy even in your stomach. And uh, that's your body reacting to shock. So cardiogenic shock, your blood isn't pumping at all. Therefore, it can't push. There's no blood pressure to push uh, nutrients and oxygen into vital organs. Um, so let's move on to the next one here. We got hypovolemic shock, which hypo meaning too low and uh, volume meaning um, that you have too low a volume. So hypovolemic shock is uh, simply that too low a blood volume. And uh, this can happen in, in several different ways, right? So you could be, um, you could have a laceration and you're bleeding uh, profusely and you're basically draining your, your arteries and your veins and capillaries and everything of blood. So you only have a certain amount of space and you only have a certain amount of blood. And when you drain out some of that blood, you now have a very inefficient pump. You don't have enough volume to, to maintain that blood pressure level that you need in order to perfuse organs or in order to push oxygen and nutrients across um, the barriers and things and reach your, your organs, your brain, your cells. Um, it could, so most of it is you've lost volume of some kind, whether it, it's a be a laceration or you have... Uh, lost a limb or something, you're bleeding profusely. In fact, you could probably even be bleeding internally. Um, and uh, and it's still the same effect because it's not being held inside your, your veins um, as you go through there. And so you don't, don't get that blood pressure. Uh, distributive shock. So these are conditions that impact your vessels directly. So something happens that uh, that impacts um, the, the vessels that changes their vessels, um, this could be some neurological impact that allows your vessels to, to, uh, change, to expand, to constrict, um, there, uh, I'll give you this example here. We have like anaphylaxis, uh, or anaphylactic shock. This is maybe, uh, an allergic reaction to something. And, uh, what really happens is your, 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 veins and your primarily your arteries they start to expand and they start um, getting larger and larger and so the space inside your veins and your arteries excuse me i keep saying veins and i'm talking arteries here they expand to the point that there's so much volume inside of them but we haven't increased the blood volume so there's a lot of inefficient space you basically have created way more volume inside the arteries and you can't fill it up any anymore you have you have no more blood to fill it up <laughs> and uh so you have this dilation that takes place and there's a lot of signs and symptoms that come with that um and lots of things can cause this anaphylactic reaction and uh you can even get swelling of of your organs as well um and uh you know they can cut off your your, uh, your breathing, which again inhibits you getting even more oxygen because uh, you're not bringing it in. And there's several signs and symptoms too. So feeling lightheaded, swollen eyes, chest tightness, um, difficulty breathing, um, itchy skin. Right? I mean, people are probably reading through this saying, man, and I get this just walking outside, right? You know, in the springtime when everything's blooming, but, but this would be a severe reaction. Um, treatable by epinephrine, in fact, and hopefully you could get, um, or if you don't know, you might be tested and you can carry epinephrine and that will help reverse these, these effects. So that's a, an example of distributive shock. So another example of distributive shock would be septic shock. And septic shock is, um, well, your body becomes septic. Um, and sepsis is definitely 
it, you can die from that because you have had something internally. Uh, it's gotten into your bloodstream. You, your body and your blood have become poisoned, essentially. And uh, because of that, your hemoglobin doesn't retain the oxygen. You can't make the transfer that you need to. Um, and you're saturating your blood with bad things. And, um, and it's toxic. And it's, your, uh, your body's going to start shutting down because you can't deliver the oxygen you need to to those those peripheral organs. And um, so as you saw in this little animation here, you see that the that the the lack of oxygen starts to cause those tissues to to fail. Um, an example of this would be like um, anybody have maybe an appendicitis? Um, if you have a, a ruptured appendix, you uh, you can get this thing called peritonitis. Um, just bad stuff in your body, right? And the peritonitis um, can actually cause your body to become very septic, and you can go into septic shock from that. So, um, again, lots of things that cause us not to have the blood volume, the the oxygenated blood that we need, and it it hinders perfusion to our brain or organs and things like that. So, treating shock, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, as first aiders or first responders, um, even without advanced medicine. Uh, and if you recognize somebody in shock, and there's many, many things that cause that, right? We just covered uh, just a, a couple of them here, but you know, you, you need to lay them down on their back. You know, if you can elevate their legs about 12 inches, um, what that does is it helps pull the blood out of their legs and elevate their blood pressure in their core around their, their heart and allows that increased blood volume also helps the heart be efficient in pumping and getting the oxygen to those locations. You know, people that are in shock, they're going to be cold and you don't want them to, to progress and get worse. So you want to try to keep them warm, not hot, just warm. So cover them with blankets. Um, you don't really want to feed anybody that is in shock. Uh, one of the side effects of being in shock, whether you hit your head or whether you cut your finger or uh, um, lacerated your arm, you know, all of these things that occur and your body reacts in a shock-like fashion, your stomach uh, reacts as well and you get very queasy. And uh, if we add things in there, you're gonna, uh, it's all gonna come back up. And then you can severely impact this shock and make it worse because now you're losing uh, liquid. You're losing what you need, water. We need 80% of our blood is water. And if we lose that, that, uh, that liquid, that water in our system, then it does impact and it makes the shock worse. So you don't want, want to give people food or drink. And uh, of course, if you don't know what it had taken place, you don't know what caused this injury or accident or something, you don't want to move them if you can avoid it. Um, you want to keep them in the place, treat them as they are, uh, elevating the legs is is minimal. Um, you do don't want to do it aggressively, but um, you do want to try to get their legs up to that will help at about that's about the the amount of movement you would want to want to do. Um, give for the first aid. You know, if somebody's bleeding, right? <laughs> They're bleeding out. The shock is going to get worse. It's just the reality, right? So you got to stop and care for that. You need to to um, to bandage them up, control the bleeding. And um, then you can start handling the rest and dealing with the rest. So if you can control the bleeding with, with basic first aid, um, then uh, you can stop that draining uh, of blood and worsening of shock to them and, and hopefully start countering some of those reactions. Uh, epinephrine, uh, we talked about it a little bit ago. Um, so for anaphylactic shock, um, that epinephrine uh, is life-saving. And people that have severe allergies to things, peanuts, shellfish, um, things like that, they they carry epinephrine and, and should. And it will actually help the, the vessels to constrict back to the size that they they need to and open up their airway and get them to breathe again. So it is very life-saving. Um, and then provide an oxygen. And it seems very simple, but shock is a lack of perfusion, right? So you don't have the oxygen getting to the organs. So if we can boost the amount of oxygen that you're taking in, 
then what is being transferred um, could potentially be a little bit more and actually help counter the effects of shock. Uh, very simple treatment. And especially in an emergency setting, and there's a lot that goes into oxygen. Um, there's a lot of times you don't want to administer oxygen. Um, but if somebody's in shock, and in, in these ones that we have kind of covered, oxygen in that, that immediate can help and can be very beneficial in uh, encountering those, those impacts of shock. So um, don't forget the O2. So emergency oxygen. Um, is a simple training too that we offer up and um, that you can actually get in your workplaces. Um, you can even get it at home. Um, yes, you can get prescriptions for it if it's a constant um, thing that you're using uh, to prevent some kind of illness, but it's prescribed by your doctor. Um, but if you want to use it for an emergency, you don't need a prescription and you can get that um, from local suppliers and, uh, and they uh, can maintain them, they check the bottles for you and keep them all certified. And, and, and the training in doing this is, is simple. It's just learning how to attach, uh, when to give, how much to give. And um, as I said, that simple benefit of offering up oxygen uh, really could help. Um, and not knowing the exact uh, contributors to what's causing their shock, know at the end of the day, perfusion was the cause, a lack of oxygen. So if we can give some oxygen, at least in that short term, the initial emergency, uh, it may be able to help. And in some cases it may help a little, in other cases it may help a lot. But if we have it available, then we can give it. So I offer that up to you. That is uh, something to consider if you guys are looking at building your, your um your arsenal of tools to help um, in an emergency situation for your, your organization or your workplace or something. So and a huge benefit in O2. Thanks so much, Seth. Uh, as you were talking, we had a couple of questions come in. Um, the first one is actually near and dear to my heart. Uh, if someone is having an allergic reaction, um, at what point do you, as the bystander, know that that person has gone into shock and needs to be treated by EMS? It's a great question. So <laughs> um, you'll know right away if somebody's going to anaphylactic shock because they're not going to be able to breathe very well. <laughs> they're going to feel a tightening of things happening um, in their throat. Um, you may even get that sensation, you know, that that tingly feeling on your arms and things are constricting in their they're not able to breathe and they will progress very quickly. Um, folks have a lot of allergic reactions to many, many things, but they don't always go into anaphylactic shock. Um, and uh, so you can react, you can get itchy and, you know, things like cortisone and Benadryl help for the short, the, uh, short duration um, for those, those minimal reactions. But for full on anaphylactic shock, it happens very rapidly and um, you'll notice they're constricting them and inability to breathe. And they'll really, really communicate this tightness that they're getting and, and uh, the fear that's coming over them in that lack of being able to breathe. And really the best way to treat that is they need help now. They need, that is a, a major medical emergency. And um, if they don't get the oxygen in, they're, they're gonna go down. And then you, you run into other things, you know, starvation of oxygen to the brain, to the heart. You know, they can go into uh, what we call secondary cardiac arrest um, because they didn't get the oxygen. So uh, the best form to counter that is epinephrine. And if you know of an allergy that you have, um, say peanuts or, or shellfish or melon or something like that, and you were reacting with those things, it might be a good idea to talk to your physician um, and say, look, I'm, I'm nervous about this. Would this be a good idea? Maybe we should carry, these reactions are really bad. And I, you know, you don't want it to get so severe that you, you can't treat yourself. So um, talk to your doctor and they may prescribe to you uh, auto injectors of epinephrine. And that can, uh, it, ultimately it can save your life. So hopefully that helps. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, 
that this person has not been trained or has not had CPR certification at their employer, um, how, who do they go to to know if it's something that they can take or to know uh, who the people are at their facility that have received training? So who if I go? understand the question is if you don't have, you know, if you're, you're at a, your workplace and um, you don't have first shade CPR training, but you don't know, uh, that's probably your biggest question that, you know, if you don't know who might be qualified or, or not, um, that might be something you need to address anyway. So I would just ask your, your leadership, your boss and say, Hey, um, I'm just curious, you know, what, what's our plan for emergencies? You know, do we have people that are trained? If not, Hey, could I get trained? And, um, It'd be nice to, to have uh, that uh, uh, the emergency action plan or EAP as we call it. And, and it could be a small group, you know, accidents happen with one or two people. So it doesn't matter how, how small or how big your organization is, um, you, you just ask the question and you probably start with your leadership and say, hey, look, um, this was just a concern to me. I didn't even know if we had a first aid kit. Hey, can you guys tell me where that's located? Because if something happens, I want to be able to help, you know, just engage and start that conversation. And, um, you know, uh, employees are almost always happy to offer that training up to people and, and provide that service to them. Um, we offer that training at, at Lucas. So um, if you are interested, we can provide that and even help you get something going, um, especially if your your organization needs that uh, the EAP or emergency action plan developed. Um, but there's other providers too, that do a fantastic job. So, um, it is, uh, it is something that you can get, but you got to start the conversation. And, uh, so I encourage you to do that. Wonderful. And the last question, um, kind of along those lines, this is someone that works in a larger facility and, uh, they mentioned that they're not familiar with where any of the first aid supplies are, especially the oxygen, as we mentioned, shock earlier. Um, is that this person's question, is this based upon size of the building or number of employees that are at a company? Um, and how do they make sure that their company is up to code? Great question. So OSHA is the regulator for um, emergency supplies and things like that. So first aid kits, you know, um, how small or big, however many first aid kits you have, it really depends on the availability and uh, um, ability to get to one in a logical, timely manner, right? Most facilities will store or keep their first aid supplies or even their AED kits and oxygen um, at the lobbies or front entrances of their, of their buildings. And uh, they do that because it's a central location. Um, we have some, some, uh, uh, business partners too, that uh, they have a lot of different facilities and a lot of different um, um, types of business that's taking place, but they've kind of made a, a decision to locate all of their emergency supplies at their entrances or lobbies of their facilities. So it doesn't matter which building these folks are in, they always know it's always going to be in the lobby or location. So, Access is definitely the biggest, biggest part. I don't want to have to run a mile to go get my supplies if I have a large building, right? Uh, so you might want to store um, kits or something at, you know, the far ends of each building so that people can get to them in a timely manner. Now, for the amount of content or, or what you store in those kits, OSHA has a whole guideline on first aid kits. And um, it also in, it encourages you, you know, if you have two to three people, you want at least one to two products per three people. So if I had, per se, I had 15 people in my organization, I would probably want to have four triangular bandages in, in my kit, right? Or excuse me, um, five triangular bandages, terrible at math, five triangular bandages, and or I'd want five um, four by four um, band-aids or something to that effect. So it, it's it's kind of, it is based on number, but it's number of employees 
as it compares to the amount of contents that you would carry in your kits. And um, you can get that from the OSHA website or you can contact us too and we can kind of help you break those things out and, um, and help you along that line of what, what do you need in a first aid kit for your, for your business company or, or corporate headquarters or something. And uh, there are kind of guidelines on that. So um, hopefully I answered your question. Wonderful. Well, I'll leave the question box open for a little bit longer, uh, but I wanted to remind everyone that we do these art performance tips on a regular basis. So please check with our website uh, and follow us on LinkedIn because uh, those are where we share this information when we have another one of these micro learnings available. We do also offer continuing education events once a month. Be sure to uh, visit us at uh, lucasopt.com or follow us on LinkedIn for some more information. I don't see any other questions coming in, so I really wanna thank all of you for joining us today. And as Seth mentioned, we do offer some training on this information. Uh, we offer the oxygenation class, we offer first aid class, even refresher courses for those that have already been certified. Um, feel free to use the contact button below or to reach out to us via the website if you have any additional questions. So thanks again for joining us today for this micro learning and we will see you next time.